So this is a paper on regulatory responsiveness that Anirudh and I have written. Uh, for uh, uh, many people over here, this is pretty much the theme which has uh, actually underpinned a lot of the discourse that has happened over the last one and a half days. What does this paper do? What we are trying to do is, first of all, identify what is responsiveness? What is adequate responsiveness for a state? We ask the question, are Indian regulators responsive? We say if they are, then to what extent are they responsive? And finally, we try to explain why some Indian regulators are more responsive than the others. Now, the concept of regulatory responsiveness actually uh, applies to the executive function, the quasi-legislative functions, and the quasi-judicial function of the regulator. So for example, uh, in the executive function of the regulator, regulatory responsiveness would mean something like, how does a regulator react to an imminent case of market abuse in the market? In the case of quasi-judicial functions, regulatory responsiveness would mean, are we engaging opposition fairly? What we have tried to focus, is, uh, focus on is the regulatory responsiveness in the quasi-legislative function of the regulator, namely responsiveness in regulation making. Now, why is this paper relevant and why now? India has actually seen a proliferation of regulators since the 1990s. We, uh, as Mr. Sahu mentioned yesterday, we have close to 100 regulators at the center and state levels. If you see the number of independent regulators, regulators that are actually at an arm's length uh, distance from the government, we have about 13 independent regulators at the central level. To this audience, I hardly have to explain the rationale for why regulators should be responsive. But just to recap the discussion over the last one and a half days, the reasons why a regulator must be responsive in regulation making can, in my head, they fall into four buckets. First of all, it avoids a regulatory capture by only some of the stakeholders when you engage all the stakeholders when making regulations. Second, of course, it enables better information collection as the regulator can actually feel the pulse of the stakeholders and people who they are about to regulate. The political ideal of democracy requires that regulators must conduct a consultation. We spoke a lot about how when a law is made, it should be put up for consult public consultation. But actually, when a regulation is made, the only way I participate in regulation making is when the parliament actually reviews the legislation uh, regulation when it is placed before it. So it's not my elected representative even sitting on the regulation. And finally, uh, engaging all stakeholders and being responsive in regulation making actually increases the legitimacy and the acceptance of the regulation when it is finally enacted. Now, despite having so many regulators in India for a very long time, and despite all of us acknowledging that uh, participation of stakeholders is integral to regulation making, there is no literature which really measures how responsive are Indian regulators when they engage in regulation making. And that is why we thought that this paper would make valuable contribution to the discourse of uh, uh, responsiveness in regulation making. So how have we gone about measuring responsiveness in regulation making? We have used rule-based measures and outcome-based measures. What are rule-based measures? We have tried to evaluate whether the laws which set up regulators mandate some form of public consultation when the regulator makes a regulation. And on outcome-based measures, we have tried to develop a benchmark index of what is an adequately responsive regulation-making process. We have tried to assign quantifiable outputs to each benchmark. And then we've assigned scores, and we've applied the framework to two Indian regulators. So what are our findings in the rule-based measures? If you see the laws which have set up the different regulators in India, we see that there is no consistency between the laws on the standard of responsiveness that each regulator is expected to achieve in regulation making. So for example, while none of the financial sector laws mandate that regulators must conduct public consultation when making regulations, some of the infrastructure regulators are actually mandated by law to conduct public consultation. And even amongst those, the mandate is as wide as transparency, that the regulator is supposed to be transparent. And tomorrow, if a regulator does not conduct public consultation, 
uh, the matter goes up to court and the court interprets whether transparency includes public consultation or not. What I'm trying to say is that even amongst the laws which mandate some form of responsiveness, the standards are extremely vague and different. On outcome-based measures, we see that there is a wide difference between the responsiveness that is exhibited by different regulators. And how have we actually measured this? Like I said initially, we developed an index of benchmarks of an adequately responsive uh, regulation making process. We assigned quantifiable outputs for each benchmark. We assigned equal scores to the output. So if the regulator has achieved the output, we give them a score of one. If the regulator has partially achieved the output, we assign a proportionate score. And finally, just to test the robustness of our framework, we applied it to regulations made by SEBI, a securities market regulator, and TRI, uh, over a span of about 27 months. So just to give an idea of what are the kind of benchmarks that are, uh, uh, that are comprised in our index, I would classify these benchmarks into two buckets. One is capacity building within the regulator to conduct a public consultation process, a good public consultation process. So for example, the benchmark there would be, uh, does the regulator have enough processes to evaluate whether the previous public consultation process was effective? whether people were able to participate, whether, whether the comments were uh, uh, adequately informed, or do we need to release more data so that people are able to respond more in a more informed manner. Uh, and I would classify the second bucket of measures into the actual quality of the consultation process. Once we apply this framework to SEBI and TRI, probably it will be more clear on how these benchmarks uh, uh, are actually applicable. Uh, just to, uh, these benchmarks have actually been aggregated from uh, a variety of academic literature as well as best practices which have been issued by various international organizations. And uh, uh, we have tried to, the quantifiable output has been devised by us such that we are able to answer a yes or no uh, for satisfaction of the benchmark. So when we actually apply the framework to SEBI and TRI, what we saw is this, that both SEBI and TRI issue a multiple category of quasi-legislative instruments. So for instance, they, SEBI issues regulations, circulars, uh, and in a couple of instances we saw two notifications which were not really uh, having a, a substantive effect on the rights of parties and therefore we've not included it here. Similarly, TRI issues regulations, orders, as well as directions. So there is a whole uh, landscape of the kind of quasi-legislative instruments that are issued by, two reg by these two regulators. Over the last, uh, in these la 27 months, we saw that uh, SEBI has issued about 51 regulations and 122 circulars. TRI has issued 22 regulations, 12 orders, and 24 directions. The first output that we actually assessed was how many of these quasi-legislative instruments were actually preceded by a public consultation process of some sort. And we saw that out of the 173 quasi-legislative instruments issued by SEBI, about 18 underwent a public consultation process, which comes to about 10%. Uh, out of the 58 quasi-legislative instruments issued by TRI, about half of them, about 27 actually, a little less than half, underwent a public consultation process. So far as concerns the other benchmarks, um, does the agency publish comments received before issuing the final regulation? We saw that uh, TRI publishes each and every comment that they receive on their website in the, uh, in the course of public co uh, consultation. They also publish counter comments which are received. So essentially, it's a multi-directional flow of information. Uh, if I have views on comments that have been submitted by others, I can submit them and they are all out there in the public domain. Uh, so those are the kind of benchmarks that we have used in our evaluation. And finally, what we see is that um, the scoring is about, it's on a score of 10, and uh, because we've used 10 benchmarks, and uh, about, uh, TRI scores about 4.47, and SEBI scores about 1.10. Both are well below the halfway uh, score, and even between them, there is significant variation on the quality of the public consultation process. Just to zoom in to some of the outputs which may be important, which may give us some insights, is that uh, the number of days, the average number of days given when a public consultation process is conducted by SEBI, it's about 20 days, and uh, TRI gives about 27 days. Both fall below the global standard of 30 days that is applied across various jurisdictions. 
the cabinet has also uh, the cabinet has also issued uh, an internal memorandum which requires each department of a ministry which proposes a law to put out the draft of the law for at least 30 days before the law is actually forwarded to the cabinet for approval as an aside the time lag between the date on which the public consultation process is closed and the date on which the regulation is enacted is about 250 days in the case of sebi and about 83 days in the case of tri so uh, this would just give an idea of how many things can change in a matter of seven to eight months, especially given that regulation affects day-to-day -day procedure. And uh, therefore, this is another insight that we get into the quality of the consultation process and the outcomes. So just to quickly summarize the findings of our paper, we see that global benchmarks, when suitably quantified, they can actually, we can actually develop a framework for assessing the quality of our public consultation process. We, uh, when we actually apply it to two regulators, we see that SEBI scores fairly low, TRI does better, but both fall below the halfway benchmark. And another interesting point is when we link the outcome-based measures with the rule-based measures, and we see that, um, uh, uh, that there is a strong correlation between these two. So while TRI, the act which, uh, the TRI Act, actually mandates transparency for TRI, Whereas SEBI Act is silent on this aspect, and we uh, hypothesize that the fact that there is a legislative mandate for transparency increases the chances of you having conducted a public consultation process, and a good one at that. What are the implications of our findings? Uh, we wish to do further work on how many comments have actually been incorporated in the final regulation. So for example, while it is possible to run this exercise for try because we can see the comments are in public domain and then we can actually compare the final regulation with the previous one and take into account the comments. This exercise is not possible for uh, say SEBI because the public comments are not in public domain and therefore uh, uh, the, on the best way we can do this is compare the old, the original discussion paper, the final regulation and see how, they, how much they match. Uh, we can also possibly develop an ongoing framework for benchmarking regulators depending on the quality of consultation process that they conduct. What are the policy implications of this? First of all, it feeds into where the parliamentary oversight measures are weak. Uh, like Justice Chandrachud mentioned that when a parliamentary uh, committee actually uh, you know, evaluates the legislation, is it just paying lip service or is it actually getting into the facts of the case? Uh, similarly, when regulations are placed before the parliament, uh, uh, data like this will be extremely useful for the parliament to uh, assess whether the regulation meets certain standards. Uh, it also has certain indications for what needs to change in the law. Like I said, there is a strong correlation between rule-based measures and outcome-based measures. And where the law has a mandate for public consultation, however vague, we see that the regulator ends up doing a public consultation. And therefore, there is a possibility that uh, if we change the laws which do not have this mandate, we will see better outcomes. Thank you.